Okay. Obviously, uh, we come to the we come to the end of the week uh, after a very busy day, a very busy night, with the final debate behind us and coronavirus uh, raging around the country. Uh, I want to start by wishing a very happy birthday to Sanjay Gupta, um, who makes us proud every day. Happy birthday to Sanjay. Um, let's uh, let's start with uh, politics. And David Chalin. Good morning, Jeff. Uh, So uh, Donald Trump uh, needed a game changer last night. I'm not sure that's what this uh, debate provided for him, but um, he clearly uh, he seems to have or seemed to have gotten the message that uh, the debate number one performance was bad and not to be repeated. So we had a more civil debate, uh, but that bar was pretty low uh, to, to clear. Uh, on issue number one, as you just said, coronavirus raging across uh, the country, uh, we just couldn't have had a more stark difference of rounding the corner and going away versus dark winter to come, uh, learning to live with it versus learning to die with it. Uh, Trump said he accepted full responsibility, but never really explained what that responsibility for what. Um you know, Biden had that powerful line that if you hear nothing else, hear this and, and talked about how somebody responsible for that many deaths should not be uh, reelected and, and continuing to serve as president of the United States. Um, of course, beyond the sort of style of the toned down debate, there is a ton of substance to chew on today. Um, Health care, again, and I know we've talked about this, but it's so important to the voters And it is such a personal uh, issue that impacts so many people. And and Donald Trump just made plain again that he has absolutely no plan. They're just I know we say it over and over again, but the the notion that he just says it's going to be replaced with a beautiful plan and and pre-existing conditions are going to be covered. I I just think um, it sort of laid bare last night uh, how empty uh, that was. Um, Obviously, they had uh, exchanges. <clears throat> that are, I think are worth looking at day after on uh, immigration and, and you know, uh, family separation, uh, on climate change, energy, the economy, and, of course, uh, their their conversation about race in America. And, and, and then Donald Trump is saying he's the least racist person uh, in the room uh, also made me think back to his conversation with uh, Bob Woodward at the time of uh, George Floyd's killing and uh and sort of how he thought bob was just drinking the kool-aid when he was talking about some issues about race and um it was uh you know yet again declaring himself the least racist person in in the room um as for biden's performance i mean i i don't think he was rattled at all uh by the hunter stuff and the family stuff that trump was throwing his way and if that if that was Trump's goal with that stuff to really rattle him. I, I think the mission was not accomplished because he came, I think, pretty prepared for this stuff, pushed back, pivoted to offense on going after Trump on China and what have you. Um, so, so that did not seem to get under his skin in the way that perhaps Donald Trump was hoping it would. And then, of course, there was just the reality that uh, anybody not in the sort of Fox News and Breitbart ecosystem um, really understood what he was talking about necessarily. Um, on the uh, oil stuff, uh, you know, Joe Biden saying uh, that he wanted to phase out the oil industry. And then uh, yet again, uh, this has happened multiple times. Uh, you know, his team has to come out after the fact, or he himself did, I think, when he boarded the plane as well, and sort of do uh, what he meant to say was and, and clarified that he was talking about uh, federal subsidies. Uh, but obviously, you saw the Trump folks uh, jump on that uh, right away. And um, I just think... Um, You know, that is something we should pay attention to specifically in Pennsylvania uh, as we look at post-debate polling in that critical battleground state that comes in to see if that is having uh, resonance in some way that is uh, a negative impact for Biden. I just think that's something on our uh, to-watch list uh, because obviously uh, it has, um, you know, a particular sensitivity in in that uh, critical battleground state as it relates to uh, their economy. Uh, Biden will actually be in Pennsylvania for a couple stops tomorrow, and it'll be curious to see how much sort of the local uh, press coverage in Pennsylvania is sort of dominated by that frame or not. So I think that's all stuff we should be um, watching for. But obviously, um, 
I, it's hard to see how the fundamental dynamics of this race were altered in any way from this debate, or quite frankly, just the fundamental um, politics of, of the American electorate in the Trump era. I mean, the suburbs and women and uh, even what we've seen now with seniors. I mean, there, there are just there are fundamental shifts that we have seen over the last several years uh, that is against uh, Donald Trump. And it's hard to see how, how those kinds of that kind of movement over the last many years in American politics snaps back uh, because uh, he didn't light himself on fire last night. Uh, that being said, you saw the reporting last night uh, about the sigh of relief from Republicans from every corner, especially those working on those down ballot races in the Senate races, just to be able to get through that without uh, Donald Trump uh, taking on more water, without more damage uh, to the overall brand and the party. There was a there was a sigh of relief in that, uh, as the party can now turn its attention to try and stave off some of these losses uh, in the 11 days uh, ahead. Um, Jessica Dean was up this morning and it remained so uh, through the first part of day side. And then um, we do see all the candidates on the trail today. So Donald Trump will be down in Florida, uh, wooing those seniors at the villages. Um, he'll also do a stop in Pensacola. Uh, Caitlin Collins and Jim Acosta uh, splitting uh, the Trump day uh, in the afternoon down there in Florida. MJ Lee is in Wilmington, Delaware, where Joe Biden's going to make an appearance and make remarks on COVID and the economy and how to build back. Uh, at 2.30 uh, p.m. today are those uh, scheduled remarks. It's unclear if he's going to take questions or not. Mike Pence is casting his ballot in Indiana uh, today and then campaigns in Ohio and Pennsylvania, and Kamala Harris is in Atlanta, Georgia. So we will, we will see everyone out uh, fanning uh, across the country, uh, everyone but Biden in, in, a, in a battleground state. Um, and uh, I know we, we keep looking at that path to 270, but after... Last night, I, it just I, seems to me Donald Trump should just be planting himself for the next 11 days in Florida and Pennsylvania uh, and, uh, and then hope that sort of the political DNA in some of these other uh, toss-up states that have been Republican, uh, more of, slightly more Republican of late, fall back in the corner because um, without Florida and Pennsylvania, it's, uh, obviously, I mean, without Florida, it's really hard, but I, I think Florida and Pennsylvania is uh, his path back, so uh, he should uh, probably be camping himself out there. Uh, with 11 days to go. Uh, and I think that is where we start. Okay, so I'm going to open it up here because I'm sure people have some thoughts on the debate and the aftermath of the debate. So even before we move to Washington, uh, thoughts on, on debate? I wanted to say that um, just to follow up on something that David said, about the sort of the, the race relations aspect of the debate. I mean, I, you know, I, and I love the way Van framed it last night, the peanut butter and ketchup sandwich. This is what we're dealing with. And, you know, Trump is not just fanning the flames, but he's lighting the match and pouring fuel on it, you know, as it relates to racism and division. And I do think that Biden was much stronger in defending or sort of even explaining his record and the Obama administration's record around criminal justice reform and policing, the fact that they reduced the prison population by 19,000, uh, they gave clemency to like, you know, almost 2,000 people compared to 43 people. Uh, but, you know, obviously the legislatively, Trump got the first step back done, but administratively with all of their focus on police reform and cops and everything else, the Obama-Biden administration was very strong. And so I think that sometimes gets lost in the discussion. And so I think that was a very strong part of the debate. Okay. Other thoughts? Anyone else? Okay. I would just, the only, the only note then that I would add, um, to uh, what David Challey laid out, I think, really well uh, on everything is, you know, uh, um, in the aftermath of the debate that, you know, in which there was no game-changing moment, and we're going to look at each of the individual uh, pieces of it, whether it's on race, as Janita was just talking about, or uh, child separation that's gotten uh, rightly so a lot of attention, or COVID, or all of that. So, and we should, you know, 
look at all of that. I want to make sure that we do not, uh, as David pointed out, I don't want to ignore Biden's uh, uh, positions on uh, what he said about oil, uh, which I know he's trying to clean up, and what he said about fracking, which we have the tape uh, uh, from CNN. Again, I know he's trying to clean it up, but we, uh, we can't ignore those things uh, and just do child separation and race and COVID. So I want to make sure that we are looking at his comments on oil and fracking. Um, I do think uh, on the Breitbart, New York Post, Fox News, rabbit hole of Hunter Biden, which I don't think anybody outside of that world understood last night, it is important to note to the degree that any of that ever comes up with guests or any, uh, any reporting uh, or on reliable sources this weekend, that just after the debate, the Wall Street Journal reported that uh, their review of all corporate records so, showed no role for Joe Biden uh, on the um, uh, uh, on the Chinese deal. And yes, I do put more credibility in the Wall Street Journal than I do in the New York Post. For those who want to ask why we would take their word and not the New York Post, um, so I do think there is a distinction. Does anybody have any other thoughts before we move on? Yeah, Jeff, can you hear me, Rick? Yes, we can, Rick. So uh, on tracking, uh, and as a Pennsylvanian, because I've been following this closely in my home state for a long time, um, in, in terms of how, fra- how material the, the issue of fracking is when it doesn't occur in m- many states and uh, in, in particular in the uh, battleground states, Ohio and Pennsylvania are big in that regard, but frankly, uh, I think we should include uh, at least the polls that we we review and approve from Pennsylvania in terms of whether Pennsylvanians are in support of fracking in, in a substantial way, and it's pretty much on the ones the polls that I've seen, and I'm not sure all of them are viable for CNN. David and Jen would know, but it's about a 50-50 split. So it's not like everybody in Pennsylvania is for fracking and this is really going to hurt Joe Biden and uh, as Trump uh, and his supporters continue to say. I mean, uh, th- there's a lot of opposition to it for, for environmental reasons, et cetera. So I don't know if it's a game changer and might be a story we send someone there to take a look at since there's been so much discussion about it. But I, I don't think we have to make it about the polls. I think we just have to make it about his position. Well, but Jeff, even if he has gone back and forth, if it doesn't make that much difference to, uh, if it's not a, a game changer in Pennsylvania, what difference does it make? Well, well, we, we hold Donald Trump, we hold Donald Trump's feet to the fire when he changes his positions. Uh, right. I'm saying that we, need to, we just need to, do the same again. I, I think. No, I agree with that. I'm just saying that there's two steps to it. One is exactly what you're saying, and Daniel's done. The other part is a, is a material in, in the battleground states that where fracking takes place, because outside of the battleground states, some a lot of people don't even know what fracking is. So I just thought you, we might, if we have a um, acceptable poll, we might just put it out there, and then people can use that when they're discussing that with uh, some of our political analysts. Thanks. Well, I, I would add to what Rick said, also being from Pennsylvania, people have no idea. Fracking is actually, like, one, they have no idea what it is, and two, they don't understand it saves entire towns, like, like entire towns' economy is on the line. So I think we need to explain what the process is, how many jobs it's creating, why it's such a specific issue in certain <clears throat> states, and why people believe it could move the numbers. Because I think if you're not from a state where fracking is a job creator, it doesn't mean anything to you. Okay. Other thoughts? Hey, Jeff, it's, uh, it's Richard Davis. I would just say this. Um, you know, the oil and gas industry is, is, a, is a huge employer in Pennsylvania. There are 32,000 people right now currently employed uh, in that industry. Um, and analysts that we've spoken to said a ban on cracking would have an immediate and severe impact on the interest on the industry that on, honestly has already been kicked in the teeth because of depressed oil prices. So it, I, I think you're, you're correct in saying that outside of, 
of these states. It may not have a material impact, but but in these states, they are a major employer, and 32,000 is not a small amount. Okay. I also I, I want to be clear. I don't want a disproportionate amount of attention on oil and fracking. Uh, all, the only point I was trying to make is that we shouldn't ignore it, uh, given we're going to obviously talk about child separation comments and race comments and COVID and COVID and healthcare, obviously, probably the two biggest things out of last night. Just uh, all I'm trying to say is uh, let's make sure we don't ignore. That's all. Anyone else? Okay, Washington. Okay, so um, on voting, um, these numbers continue to be enormous. Um, 46 million votes cast in 48 states, um, closing in but not yet surpassing the 2016 numbers um, of early voting. Um, the Democrats have dominated this uh, voting by mail, and uh, but as we see more Republicans um, uh, doing early voting, those numbers are, are starting to close. Um, and Pam will have um, the wrap on voting today and all the various um, the various elements to that. The only other real thing from Washington is this, um, and again, it's it's the the stimulus, which is um, Pelosi and Mnuchin are still talking. It is very unless they actually get something today and get it into legislative language by tomorrow, it's not happening. But it still does seem to be not completely dead yet. And that's really the highlights from here. Okay. Does anybody have any thoughts on Washington, Trump, White House, election, Biden, anything before we move on? Okay, coronavirus, Matthew. Okay, so we are coming off uh, the highest case number day since July. In fact, one of the highest case number days, period. Uh, as a key model declares, the winter surge has begun. Uh, almost 72,000 new cases yesterday, and the average of daily new cases is now over the 60,000 mark for the first time in months. On that winter surge, IHME's new model uh, projects over 385,000 deaths by February. Surgeon General Adams uh, just told a conference a few minutes ago, we are really concerned that in a few weeks we'll start to see deaths increase. Obviously, a break from the president's message last night that it's going away. Hospitals are filling up in large and small areas across the country. The number of people hospitalized is up a third since the beginning of October. And the message on masks is getting even louder and even clearer. The journal Nature releases a study today showing mask use could save 130,000 American lives going forward. And IHME's model language uh, notes that as things have gotten worse and worse, mask use and social distancing rules have not increased. In fact, it says the two lowest mask use states, North and South Dakota, uh, which are also the two highest per capita state. So the message is pretty clear. As we look around the country, key regions, key data points, at least six states reporting record case numbers Thursday. The White House Task Force latest report warning of, quote, deterioration in Sunbelt and Midwest and northern states. In Illinois, this is the day uh, more restrictions kick in in the Chicago area. Bars and non-essential businesses have to close at 10. Bars have to seat people outside. Uh, Deborah Burks, while visiting Chicago yesterday, warned uh, it won't be as simple as closing public spaces because public spaces were very safe and probably remain safe, she says. Uh, she says that what has happened over the past few weeks has really uh, been about people moving their social gatherings indoors. We have Adrian in Chicago on all of this. Uh, hospital capacity warnings all over, especially in the West, uh, an Idaho uh, hospital system says hospitals are 99% full. Utah warns hospitals are filling up and that 20% of ICUs there have only COVID patients. St. Louis uh, hospitals telling our affiliate they are approaching crisis mode. Uh, in uh, New England, growing cases linked to ice hockey lead Massachusetts to join New Hampshire and Vermont in closing ice rinks. And growing problems 
uh, in churches around the country, as well as nursing homes that we've been talking about, uh, which continue to be a huge problem. The latest outbreak in Atlanta with almost 50 cases and Nick Valencia uh, in Atlanta. On the school front, certainly uh, we remember all that controversy over the pressure over CDC school guidance. Well, now uh, the House Select Committee uh, says that a top CDC scientist has acknowledged to them that the current guidance is outdated. It's being revised because he says uh, it does appear children can become infected and clearly can transmit in schools. Obviously, in context, we have not seen mass infections in schools nationwide, but very notable on this guidance. Uh, in Houston, schools reportedly dealing with large numbers of teachers uh, in a stick out over safety concerns. And then on the college front, uh, which remains a bit of a mess as Florida cases rise, Bethune Cookman University going into lockdown over a campus spike, and University of Michigan remaining under a campus stay at home order uh, as so many undergrads have gotten sick there. We have Bianca and Evan on the education front. Uh, from health uh, today, just noting uh, on treatment a couple of key notes. Uh, as we reported, the FDA fully authorizing remdesivir for COVID. Uh, it doesn't seem to prevent deaths, but does shorten hospital time. And separately, uh, convalescent plasma found in a new study to have only limited success. Key uh, health speakers and newsmakers to watch today beyond this ongoing Surgeon General uh, uh, event right now. Pfizer's CEO speaks to the same conference at 12.30. The NIH director speaks to the press club at 2. Operation Warp Speed briefing at 3. We'll watch all of those. Sanjay, Elizabeth, and Jacqueline Howard available from the health team. Uh, and then just a sports note going into the weekend, opening weekend for the Big Ten uh, after all the back and forth on resuming the season. Kicks off in Wisconsin tonight uh, where the governor urged people to watch the game alone. Uh, Michigan's president tells Sanjay on New Day that he believes uh, things are safe uh, because of the conference's daily rapid testing plan, driving the likelihood of sick players almost to zero, he believes. Uh, and the wrap piece today on COVID is Nick Watt for four, six, eight, and ten. And I'm going to go. Look, I, I just want to say that uh, I, I know there's a tremendous amount of focus on the debate and the election, which is now 11 days away, as it should, you know, as it should be. But uh, we cannot underplay what's going on with COVID in the United States. The numbers are just, the numbers speak for themselves. The number of cases, the number of hospitalizations, the number of deaths, tremendously uh, uh, on the rise, all as the official start of the flu season is here. This is a, this is a disaster right now, and we cannot uh, underestimate this. Does anybody have any thoughts on COVID? Hey, Jeff, I want to, one thing I would add to this really quick, uh, you know, Matthew mentioned this, obviously, the study coming at 11 showing just how many lives could be saved uh, wearing masks. As, as we have these discussions with, you know, everyone on air today, and, and if anyone wants to have anyone on from a church, um, these, these stories in particular of churches suing to not have to put in these mask mandates remains something that is just particularly mind-boggling to me. This is, this is such a simple solution. And another study coming out today, uh, you know, from IHME showing six-figure deaths could be avoided with people wearing masks. Why people, churches, others are still pushing back against something so simple that so clearly and definitively saves lives is, is reckless and dangerous. And I forget who said it on air, one of our contributors, it is, it is homicidal. Um, Jeff, I know Jake's been relentless about this, but I think that this is, should be a huge focus next week. No matter what we think about any issue out there, the biggest issue everyone is going to the polls with this year is the pandemic. And I think an overlooked part of the debate last night is that the president basically said, I'm going to do nothing. I mean, he basically said, it's all coming. It'll end someday. He has no ideas. He won't even push mask wearing when we hear statistics like what Ben just said. It, it, it's the thing that matters. The fact that the president, the incumbent, is refusing to deal with the biggest problem right in front of his face, even as it gets worse and worse. I totally agree with you, Jim. Any other thoughts?
Jeff, it's David. Um, in light of some of the conversation we just had, I think it'd be worth doing a deep dive into the plight of the school teacher as we go into the fall colder months and a level of stress and anxiety uh, that so many of these people are, are going through every day and the social or, or psychological and long-term impact of feeling like they're compelled to go into a dangerous environment. I think it'll be a good story. Anyone else? Matthew, you want to take the rest of domestic, please? Okay, there's a new case involving a fatal police shooting of a young black man. Uh, this is in Waukegan, Illinois, sparking some protests. An officer who shot into a car said to be driving in reverse uh, uh, toward him, killing Marcellus uh, Stinnett, the national desk and policing team working on this and getting this out. Uh, also, Kentucky's governor calling on the attorney general there to release, quote, everything from uh, the Breonna Taylor grand jury proceeding, a second anonymous grand juror speaking out uh, to back up the notion that they were only presented the option of the lesser charges. And finally, just keeping an eye on these devastating wildfires in the West, particularly in Colorado, uh, this one fire called the East Troublesome Fire, uh, going from basically nothing to almost 200,000 acres in a matter of a couple of days, uh, taking lots of homes, forcing lots of evacuations, one of about 60 fires uh, we're watching around the U.S. right now, uh, and Chad and Allison in the Weather Center can handle this. And that's it. Okay, thank you. International. Um, so obviously we're very much focused on the debate, um, but we're getting to COVID as well. Um, just on the debate, we've got Nick Robertson, who can handle all the diplomatic um, reaction from overseas, you know, Russia's um, comments that this is a competition of, of basically against who dislikes Russia the most, China's reference to um, Trump, Trump's filthy air comment, the skies are blue today, um, and also the North Korea alliance. He can kind of pull all of that together. We've also got regional reporters as well. Um, on COVID, um, Wales has gone into, goes into lockdown tonight. We're covering that. Scott McLean handles all the different Europe angles. Uh, we're seeing the highest spike in more than a month in South Korea, which is interesting, bearing in mind they've kept things um, so under control to date. Paula Hancock is on that. Australia is starting to increase the small numbers of citizens um, who are allowed to return home. It's actually a staggering number of uh, Australian citizens who are still stuck out there. 26,000 want to come back. So we're also recovering that, we're covering that with Christy Lustau. Um, and some breaking news, this terror threat um, in Turkey, the U.S. mission in Turkey has said that they have credible reports of a potential of potential terrorist attacks and kidnappings against U.S. citizens, foreign nationals in Istanbul, and against the U.S. consulate. So um, Arwa Damon is covering that from Istanbul. Okay, great. Thank you. Yes, that's an interesting story. Um, business. Good morning. So equity futures rising this morning, uh, all on stimulus hopes. Uh, obviously, we know the House Democrats are, are seeking a deal, but serious sticking points remain. A Fox Business moment ago, Larry Kudlow saying that uh, there are still significant policy differences between the two, the two sides. We're probably closer than we were a week or two back, but still major policy differences uh, remain. Romans and Aleshi uh, are often available on that. They're also parsing some uh, big economic threads from last night. The president's familiar arguments, including that Biden win, would crush the stock market and cause a depression. As we know, neither has any basis. In fact, President also just suggesting that big Wall Street analysts agree with him. No, they don't, as Matt Egan has been reporting. Uh, with no stimulus deal in sight, though, markets still rising with the belief that investors uh, believe that a blue wave could deliver uh, fiscal stimulus, which Wall Street obviously very much, much wants. We're also tracking retail this morning, putting money in the pockets of Americans. Very important as we head into the holiday season. Uh, Christina Oleshi reporting uh, via Deloitte that Americans plan to spend 38% less than they spent last year. This is not at a level since uh, seen since the Great Depression. The pressure in retail causing big behemoths like Gap to drastically scale back their brick-and-mortar footprint. Gap announcing late yesterday an investor conference that they are going to close upwards of 30% of its uh, Gap and Banana Republic stores beginning in 2024. Uh, we're also watching a trending story on how Americans' lives are changing post-COVID. Macy's announcing that Santa Claus will not be visiting any Macy's stores in 2020, ending the 159-year holiday tradition, obviously due to concerns regarding the coronavirus and the spread of that. 
Instead, Macy's uh, creating an interactive virtual experience. Uh, so we are up on that as well. And lastly, in non-COVID news, Georgia County uh, is ground here to what may be the first ransomware attack to hit uh, election infrastructure this political season. It was on Hall County, home to Gainesville, uh, roughly one hour north of Atlanta, and this was disclosed in early October. Uh, so Brian Fung has been up uh, and reporting on that. And obviously, we know that there's been a significant uptick in ransomware attacks in the past few months, and that is where we begin. Okay. Thank you. Um, anything else in Washington? Nope. So um, before we move on to digital, does anybody else have anything they want to bring up? Hey, Jeff. Uh, hey, Jeff. Yep. Hey, Jeff. Can you hear me? Yes, Mike. Yes, we can. Hey, I just want to thank you. I just want to follow up on what David said about school teachers, which I totally agree with. But I want to add something to that because I think it relates to the conversation, the debate last night and the overall conversation about performance during the pandemic. So as the parent of a school teacher, as well as two kids who are in college, there are basically two things that make a difference when you're talking about schools and the safety of school teachers and professors and students and all the people that work around those places. And the first one is a SPARC plan. And the second one is the money to execute that plan. And places that have a SMART plan and have money to execute that plan are doing very well in terms of being open, whether it's in a full in-school situation or a hybrid situation or whatever it is. And the places that don't have a SMART plan or don't have, or have a plan but don't have the money to execute that plan are having trouble. And the fact is that, as Biden pointed out last night, they need that money to execute those plans to get schools open. And the Trump administration has not focused on that. Trump ordered schools to be open. Governors like DeSantis ordered schools to be open without providing the funding that they needed to create a plan to keep teachers and students safe. And there are places that locally did things to, to make that happen. But overall, the federal government should be doing so much more because I 100% agree that schools should be open. It's a key piece of the economic um, uh, status of the country as well as the physical and mental well-being of the country, both for kids and parents. But the fact is that they need that money. And the bill that's sitting there has a lot of money for schools to protect students and teachers in it. And Mitch McConnell and others like that have blocked that funding, and I think that that's a huge piece of this. And it was an interesting, it was an interesting conversation in the debate last night. Trump didn't have any facts on that. Trump didn't have any response to that when Biden talked about the schools and the money they need to open safely. I think it's a really big deal, and I think we should be focused on that. And so, uh, Virginia, Matthew, Leora, let's make sure that we have Bianca and and. And then we're looking at this, okay, please? Yep. Thank you. Anyone else? Hey, Jeff, yeah, on the George Floyd uh, case, I'm not sure if we got to this or not, but I really highly recommend reading the order the judge issued declining to dismiss the second degree murder charges. It is a savage takedown of Derek Chauvin. It sounds like the prosecution's closing argument. Um, you know, uh, and it's just stunning. Um, Miriam McHale has isolated the, the best um, quotes from it, if anybody's interested. Um, but it's just really powerful language about he, how even after he had stopped resisting, he got the knee on for four minutes. Even after the EMTs got there, he still didn't remove his knee from his neck. Um, it's chilling, really, really. And I know we're having a lot of stuff going on, but I think this is a, a summation of the brutality of what happened that I wouldn't have expected from a judge. Okay, great. Let's make sure we look at that. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, digital. Good morning. So we had 34.6 million uniques yesterday. Trump's 60 Minutes interview, our top in uniques was over 2 million. Our debate daily had 1.7 million. Also notable that it was our most engaged article yesterday with an average of about nine minutes per unique. Uh, we had four more over a million. Stephen Collinson analysis on Obama's scathing takedown of Trump. 
Chris Eliza analysis, Trump just handed Biden a devastating debate attack, the Derek Chauvin charges, and Noah Cyrus at the CMT Music Awards. Topping the charts today centers around the debate, and we have a lot of strong pieces. Our opinion roundup, uh, who won the, the debate, commentary from CNN contributors, over 10,000 concurrent, followed by Collinson analysis that is leading sites right now with the headline, Trump dials back his anger, but his debate performance doesn't change the fact. The full video of the debate is doing well, and another video on Trump's response about responsibility on coronavirus surprises Biden also doing well. Um, elsewhere in the debate, just to run through a few others resonating with audience this morning, our fact checks from the fact checking team, and we have separates on Biden um, on oil and fracking. Uh, so Liz has hit the Mrs. Zach Wolf's uh, cheat sheet on debate topics. Uh, we have a lot of really strong content, and our audience this morning is here for it. On coronavirus today, our main right is keeping on the big picture, record day in cases, and keeping a look at what's in store. An interesting one coming from Scotty Andrew on El Paso, where things are getting so bad, foreigners are bringing in refrigerated trucks to house COVID-19 dead bodies. We have also have a look at the seemingly unstoppable surge crippling Europe and all the new restrictions happening there. Otherwise, a couple more to mention. McConnell's health, he says there's no concerns despite visible bandages and bruises. Also a top story this morning in the mix of debate content. And we have an exclusive from business inside the SEC's whistleblower program that just paid a record $114 million award. Uh, this weekend, looking to stay newsy and urgent on the big themes, election, coronavirus. Uh, but just to mention this one, uh, we're publishing our final installment of The Reckoning. Inara Verzeniak takes us to Bay City, Michigan, an aging, declining town, hard hit by coronavirus, whose residents are coming up together to help each other stay fed and closed in the absence of meaningful help from the federal government. I'll stop there. Thank you, Christina. The McConnell, the McConnell uh, health mystery is a good story. Um, John. Good morning, Jeff. Uh, so we're equal parts um, election follow-up from the debate, as well as uh, coronavirus and the intersection between the two. Uh, we do turn the corner uh, with how this uh, debate from last night will frame the next week and a half on the trail. Uh, Trump does get back on the trail today, goes to Florida. Caitlin Collins is there ahead of um his uh, rallies later on this afternoon and evening. And then MJ Lee is in Delaware, where we will hear from Biden at 2.30 uh, to discuss the economy and coronavirus. Um, on uh, the coronavirus uh, follow-up from the debate and all the greater coronavirus threads, as well as uh, the discussion about um, a health care plan, we do have uh, um, HHS Secretary Azar uh, next hour with Jim Shudo, uh, Sanjay Gupta, and Dr. Reiner, um, and other doctors uh, up around that conversation. Um, a lot of step backs uh, on the debate, looking at the overall tone, the different tone, the substance, any game-changing moments. Jeff Zeleny, Carl Bernstein, uh, Laura Baron Paul Lopez, and Tulu Olorinipa on that. On the separated children, we do have um, uh, Raul Reyes. Uh, on the environment, uh, the oil and fracking answers, uh, Bill Weir will um, uh, take a look at that. Uh, foreign influence questions, Mike Rogers and Miles Taylor. Uh, Race in America, Angela Rye and Errol Lewis. Uh, and the L. Reeves and Jason Carroll pieces. Uh, we'll get a couple of runs today. We're going to bundle them together uh, on Jim and Poppy and then Brianna. Um, on coronavirus itself, Elizabeth Cohen will take lead on just the um, uh, escalating numbers. Uh, John King is going to do some magic wall hits, kind of uh, looking at these numbers as well. Uh, lots of really good headlines to get into uh, in our domestic whips, the um, uh, California megachurch cluster, uh, the um, hockey clusters in Massachusetts. We will shine a very bright light on that um, mask study uh, that uh, was mentioned earlier on the call that drops at 11 a.m. Uh, Big Ten um, begins its games. Mayors in these uh, college towns are really concerned, especially in the shadow of um, uh, what happened with the SEC, uh, plus the Macy Santa story. It's just a good cultural story to um, grab onto, so we'll, we'll look to get that in as well. Uh, on voting, uh, Kristen Holmes coming up around um, the early voting numbers, continuing to smash records. Uh, they just alerted it's now more than 50 million people have already cast their ballots. So we'll continue to uh, discuss uh, that incredible phenomenon. Uh, the path to 270, uh, John King's going to look ahead to where the candidates are heading the next few days and what that tells us about the map. Uh, and finally, uh, two other stories that we will um, uh, get into the mix. Uh, Manu Raju keeps an eye on stimulus talks and, and what actually happens or doesn't happen with them today. Uh, and we just hit the um, threats against Americans in Turkey story with Arva Damon. Thank you, John. Washington. 
Good morning. Um, as John mentioned, uh, Biden speaking at 2.30, I imagine, might slip into 3 o'clock, so we'll be prepared for that. We've got Arlette on Biden. We've got Caitlin as our White House person. Um, uh, Nick Watt is our coronavirus rapper today. Um, Pam Brown uh, doing the voting rights rap. Um, and we may do a guest out of that as well. Lots of coverage of coronavirus with Dr. Adam Jarrett and Dr. William Schaffner. We'll get a little Cohen in the three as well, and we'll look at that mass study. Um, we'll stay on the path to C70 and look at the Senate races. Uh, Julia Chatterley on stimulus and more international reporters, and then Gloria Van, uh, Ron Brownstein, Nia Malika as well. And in the Situation Room, COVID will remain our top focus. Uh, cases, deaths, hospitalizations all on the rise. Uh, the U.S. seeing the highest number of cases since July. Uh, we'll be monitoring the events today with the Pfizer CEO, Francis Collins, uh, Operation Warp Speed. Uh, we'll see if anything comes out of those. And uh, we'll cover it all with our COVID wrap pieces, our international whips, and our medical voices, I- including Rick Bright and former CDC Director Tom Frieden. And with uh, 11 days to go, we will, of course, keep our focus also on the race to 270, how, if at all, uh, Biden's comments about oil and fracking last night uh, will have any effect on his standing in Pennsylvania. Uh, we'll also be looking at the other top threads from last night, uh, COVID, immigration, health care. Uh, we have a cocktail for us from Pensacola, uh, Phil Mattingly at the wall, uh, Biden campaign reporters, as well as other political voices. Uh, we'll see if anything comes out of stimulus talks and uh, early voting, uh, 50 million ballots cast. Uh, we'll dig into that with our Pamela Brown rap piece. And that is where we start. Great. Thank you very much. Is there anything uh, else for today that anybody wants to discuss? Hey, Jeff, it's Cynthia. And I don't know if there's a place for it with everything going on, but I did want to bring it up. This um, this week, uh, coming up next week, Chile is voting on a new referendum for a new constitution. The constitution, and this is the reason why Chile has been such a disaster. And I, I imagine there's got to be somewhere for it. And the reason for this is the following. They're going to be voting on a constitution because the constitution they currently have is from the era of Pinochet. And the reason they keep voting and they've had all these protests is because they're looking for something that gets rid of some of the Pinochet um, wording and uh, protections that were in there. And so if not, they're going to continue to have a disaster and an unstable Chile is not good for the U.S., and it's not good for Latin America. And so at some point in in some show, I think we need to bring that up, because if not, we're going to keep seeing the destabilization of what at one point was the stable country in Latin America. Got you. Thank you. No problem. Anybody else? All right, let's move to the weekend, please, and start with Smirkanish. On the road to 270, we're going to look at mail-in ballots. Hundreds of thousands could be rejected. A recent Q poll found that 69% of Biden voters expected to vote by mail, compared to 21% of Trump voters. Early data shows three key voting blocks that overwhelmingly support Joe Biden are most likely to have their ballots flagged or rejected. Young voters, Black and Hispanic, and first-time mail-in voters. 2016, over 300,000 were rejected. More than half a million were thrown out in this year's primary, and not every state kept track. We know in the primary, over 37,000 were thrown out in Pennsylvania alone. Let's not forget, Trump won PA by a little over uh, by a little over 44,000. Wisconsin, over 23,000 ballots were rejected in the primary. Trump won that by a little over 22,000. So far in North Carolina, 61% of ballots that need to be fixed belong to Democrats compared with 18% for Republicans. In Florida, 14,000 ballots won't be accepted unless they are fixed. The good news, North Carolina and Florida have ballot curing process, so they can fix these. But not all states notify their their voters that they won't be counted or allowed them to fix the mistakes. So mail-in voting can be a problem for Biden, not because of fraud, but human error. We have Michael Hernan, professor of government at Dartmouth College. And on COVID, we're going to have a debate with Tulane professor John Barry, who wrote the book on the great influenza. He also wrote a piece for the New York Times, What Fans of Herd Immunity Don't Tell You, and one of the authors of the great Barrington Declaration, Dr. J. Batachara. And that's where we start. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, tomorrow night, we have a, a CNN special report at 10 p.m., uh, reported by Randy Kay, Divided We Stand, Inside America's Anger. 
Jim Murphy, do you want to just bring us up to speed on that? Uh, yes, this is a really fascinating pandemic time road trip through uh, one of the biggest and most important states, Florida, uh, by Randy Kay and Matt Reynard that uh, will show you the bizarre multiple universes that America's voters live and think inside of um, everything from black communities to the Hispanic communities uh, all over the state uh, to uh, elderly people actually getting into fist fights at the villages. Um, it's pretty remarkable how far out there people have gone over the last few years. Okay, great. Again, that's tomorrow night at 10 p.m. Eastern. Um, let's move to Sunday, please. Let's start with Inside Politics. With nine days to go, we'll talk to our reporters about the candidates' closing messages. Is this race still Trump versus Trump, a president failing to lead during a pandemic with a rocky economy? Also taking a look at the past 270 and where the candidates are going, spending, plus the Obama factor. And as the U.S. approaches a record new case count, we'll examine the anatomy of this third surge and the strain on the system with our doctors and filmmaker Ken Burns versus John King comparing maps and magic walls on elections in times of crises. And that's where we start. Okay. Thank you. State of the Union. Hey there. Uh, we are still working on our bookings and should hopefully have something to announce from the White House shortly. Uh, we do have Speaker Nancy Pelosi, so we'll talk to her about the latest on the stimulus, see if she will, uh, you know, tell us whether a deal is dead before the election, and if so, what happens to all the millions of people who need help. We'll also talk to her about all of the surging COVID numbers and election interference. We also have Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, um, so we have a time to talk to her about out of the debate, Biden's comments on climate change, fracking, and oil. Um, we'll get her talk to her about her get out the vote efforts before the election and some of the positions and statements Biden has made uh, during the general election and where uh, she may and, and those approving of the party may push him if he ends up being elected. Okay, thank you very much. GPS. Uh, thanks, Jeff. We will start with a very strong take from Farid on why he thought Trump would lose last time and why he thinks Trump is gonna lose this time because America is a better place and Americans are better people than what Donald Trump symbolizes. Um, we have a panel to talk about all sorts of election related issues from what the election looks like in other countries to the severity of foreign interference in the election and much more. That panel is Ian Bremmer, former British finance minister, George Osborne and Time Magazine, Charlotte Alter. We'll do voting suppression and other voting issues with Jessica Usman of uh, ProPublica, and we'll do the pass to 270 with Nate Cohn. Thank you. Reliable sources. All right. We'll get into the Trump, I'm sorry, the Murdoch smear machine, and also why most of America actually needs a Fox translator to understand what the president's really saying. Um, we'll get something that came up on the call yesterday, the term packing the courts and things like defunding the police, how these talking points are getting into coverage. Uh, we'll get into that. Uh, Larry Wilmore is going to be with us. And Brian went to the battleground state of Pennsylvania to talk to a local newspaper um, who's covering it, despite the fact that they don't even have an office anymore. And that should do it. Great. Thank you. Um, does anybody have anything else they want to bring up? Okay, let's uh, let's remember. Uh, obviously, there's two driving stories for us: uh, the election and coronavirus. Um, we've had a terrific week. Thank you to everybody on all of our platforms. Um, let's remain uh, newsy, urgent, strong, and play error-free ball. We head into the final 10 days of the campaign this weekend. Um, this is uh, an incredibly important time for us. Thank you to everybody for all you're doing. And remember, please stay safe. Uh, this is a very uh, dangerous time in the country with regard to COVID. Please take care of yourself. Please stay safe. And, uh, and again, thanks for all you're doing. Have a good day and a good weekend. Bye-bye.